Good to see everybody here. We had a great start last night with the Attorney General and looking forward to a couple of uh, good panels this morning. Uh, this panel is on the coronavirus and the Constitution. Uh, my name is R.J. Pastrito. I'm Dean of the Van Andel School of Statesmanship uh, on campus and also a professor of politics. And I'm going to try to moderate this group of speakers for you. Uh, we've got uh, about an hour and 15 minutes, and each of our speakers will speak for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we'll have uh, some uh, perhaps discussion among them and then turn things over uh, to you out in the audience for your questions. Uh, I'm going to introduce each speaker uh, before uh, they make the presentation. And uh, our first speaker this morning is Robert Barnes. Uh, Robert Barnes, with high-profile wins for clients in constitutional, criminal, and civil law in cases across the country, lives in Las Vegas and has offices in Tennessee, Wisconsin, and California. Amongst his more prominent clients include the Covington Boys, Ralph Nader, Wesley Snipes, Jill Stein, Alex Jones, and political parties from the Greens to the Libertarians. Please join me in welcoming Robert Barnes. When most people think of the Constitution around the world, the first words that come to their mind are the words that come from our First Amendment to that Constitution. And core to that right is the right of peaceable assembly. Indeed, that right to peaceably assembly is essential to the other rights in the First Amendment the right of the freedoms of press, of freedom of speech, freedom of religious expression, and the right to petition our government for redress of grievances. Our Constitution, which was formed in a crisis, survived centuries of crises. Indeed, there were seven different smallpox epidemics over the first 15 years of our young republic. Never once did we suspend any of our constitutional rights or liberties. Not the right to assemble, not the right to speak, not the right of religious expression, not the right to go to church, not the right to petition your government for redress of grievances or the right to protest. Indeed, we, our government would survive, our constitution would survive without those rights being suspended through a, a civil war, through World War I, through World War II, and would survive all kinds of epidemics, including the Spanish flu of 1918, including the Hong Kong flu of 1968, the Asian flu of 1958, through the swine flu of 1976, another uh, virus epidemic in 2009. And throughout all of these, we never suspended our constitutional rights or liberties, including the core rights to peaceable assembly, whether that was for purposes of church or politics or any other form of expression. The right to peaceably assemble is essential to those other rights, but it stands alone until 2020, when across the country, mayors, governors, and politicians of all stripes suspended for the first time in our history the right to peaceable assembly. Indeed, it often declared assembly itself unlawful, whether it was for the purposes of attending church, the purposes of going to school, or for the purposes of political organization or rallying or petitioning for redress of grievances or the freedom of speech. How did we get to that point? Well, it's important to go back to understand the founders, and in talking about the founders, to know those founders in a broader context than just the founding fathers that have the statutes and the memorials and the paintings to them. The true founding generation the true founding fathers of the American constitutional experiment were as made up of Boston fishermen and backcountry frontiersmen and Baptist farmers as they were merchants and bankers. Indeed, it was the grandsons of those Baptist farmers who helped found a small school in southern Michigan to uphold those constitutional liberties, to extend them to abolition in support of the abolition of slavery, to expand it to be one of the first universities to allow African Americans and people of any race or any gender admission to college, and that college was Hillsdale College that still stands more than a century and a half later in celebration of that constitution. It is in respect and recognition of that legacy of liberty that we inherited, that was, that was bequeathed to us by our true founding fathers that has now suffered its most monumental crisis in its history. Some of the seeds of the problems of our 
current jurisprudence in this area of constitutional liberty and its suspension date to the trilogy of infamy of cases between 1905 and 1945, where the Supreme Court of the United States put germinated the possibilities of this day coming, where we would, and in fact legal scholars and judges alike, would openly talk about suspending the Constitution during a quote-unquote emergency. Notably, the Constitution of the Weimar Republic of Germany was celebrated as one of the great democratic constitutions of European history. How did it fail and end up birthing Nazi Germany? Because it had an emergency exception to the constitutional liberties and rights enclosed therein, and thus suspended them, effectively allowing the rise of Nazi Germany and World War II to soon follow. In that same context, the trilogy of infamy of decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court that we were supposed to have turned our back to have resurfaced and been resuscitated by lawyers and litigants alike. The first one, of course, is Jacobson, issued in 1905, where an individual was asserting that a forced vaccination should be tested by scientific evidence at trial before he should be required as a condition of his citizenship to take it during a smallpox epidemic outside of Boston. The Supreme Court in the Jacobson decision effectively said that it would defer to the executive branch and not allow such a trial to occur. That Jacobson decision was then cited as the basis for the DeBuck decision some two decades later. That is where the U.S. Supreme Court infamously authorized and approved forced sterilizations of poor women all across the South, white and black alike, in the name of, of eugenics. So when you hear some various people on the left talk about the need to respect medical science and our legal determination, I remember that when we deferred to those in the white lab coats at the very beginning of about a century ago, it was in the name of racist eugenics. So maybe we shouldn't be so quick to defer our political and common sense to those in the white lab coats as if we should live through a live Milgram experiment uh, of what their own druthers should be. We have a democracy for a reason. We do not defer to those in white lab coats for that democracy. But that would not be the last decision in the trilogy of infamy by the U.S. Supreme Court where it forgot its foundational bearings, where it absconded and abandoned its safeguarding of the constitutional liberties that our founders bequeathed to it. That would be the Korematsu decision of 1945, which would not surprisingly also cite the Buck decision and the Jacobson decision as its legal predicate. That would suspend the constitutional liberties for a group of Americans simply because of the nature of their ancestry. People would be removed from their homes, have their businesses taken from them, their jobs stripped away from them, their right of peaceable assembly suspended for them. What we have done now in the past year, over the past six months effectively, is taken Korematsu and applied it to the entire country in any place where the local politicians are so willing to do. So in places like Pennsylvania, in Michigan, New York, New Jersey, California, large parts of the entire country, the right of assembly has been completely suspended, the right of speech completely suspended, the right of religious expression completely suspended. In my home state of Nevada, if you want to form a church, you need to go to a casino to do so. If you want to be able to have meaningful congregation and participation, as my mom used to say when I was a kid, uh, when I didn't want to go to church on a particular Sunday morning and wanted to sleep in instead, uh, you should not forsake the fellowship of your fellow believers. Yet we are being forced to do so all across the country and in places like Las Vegas, if you want to go to church, you should just operate it inside of uh, either Caesars or the Wynn, uh, and there you can uh, rent a convention center room and actually form church. That's the peculiar logic our U.S. Supreme Court adopted this past summer, though over four notable dissents. But that ignoble history of our recent history uh, against the noble history of our constitutional liberty in the centuries before has finally met a resistance in the form of a young 41-year-old federal district court judge in the Western District of Pennsylvania appointed by President Trump. This week, he issued a decision striking down the lockdown orders of the Pennsylvania governor as unconstitutional in violation of that right of peaceable assembly, in, uh, in violation of that right of free speech, of free press, and free religious expression. Not only that, he recognized it as a violation of both substantive and procedural due process under the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution for businesses and those who would have it. As he noted, what led to a position where the judiciary was consciously and publicly stating it was going to 
to completely suspend its role as an independent check on either the legislative or executive branch in the name of a crisis. There is no emergency exception in the U.S. Constitution, though President, uh, first, our first president, George Washington, was intimately aware of the problems of smallpox. Indeed, as uh, uh, Mr. Berenson can comment upon, what the, one of the very first inclinations of then General George Washington was herd immunity should be the solution for dealing with viruses. He inoculated his soldiers with very small doses, hopefully not enough to cause them to incur the full wrath of smallpox, which had a 30% fatality rate, which is far, far higher than the one that COVID-19 presents to us. He understood that, and yet he didn't have an emergency exception to the U.S. Constitution. He didn't suspend our Constitution when smallpox epidemics raged across America in his first two terms as President of the United States. And yet somehow many of our governors suddenly thought that the word governor must have meant something from the colonial days, and they could start issuing royal edicts as if they were the colonial governors that we overthrew in our constitutional republic. Notably, this uh, judge, the Judge Dickman from Western District of Pennsylvania, a man from Steeltown, from Pittsburgh, someone, as Attorney General Barr was talking about last night, having more judges, having more prosecutors rooted in the local community and understanding and responsive to the democracy that is supposed to govern us is critical and essential to the functioning of justice in our modern age. And he fits that precise description. What he required was a full trial and a complete record and where finally the evidence would be tested. What is the evidence in support of these lockdown provisions? What is the counter evidence? What does this evidence look like under cross-examination? And what we found was there was almost no evidence at all. What the judge found was that the, this was more like, he, in his own words, a theoretical white paper, where you basically have the white lab coat crowd doing a live Milgram experiment on its population. For those who don't know, the Milgram experiments is where someone would be brought in, just someone with a white lab coat, they knew nothing else about them, would tell them, would you please shock this person in the other room? And, and they would tell them to keep turning up the shocks if their answers were quote unquote wrong. They had no reason to believe that the shocks were morally or legally justified. Some would express concern about their own legal liability, but as long as the person in the white lab coat kept telling them to do it, they kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And over half of the populace would do so. We're seeing that now in whether to wear masks or not wear masks, whether to social distance, when to social distance, how to social distance, whether to have a lockdown or not a lockdown. How we can have, as this judge noted, a sort of a corporate woke virus that somehow knew the difference between church and Walmart or church and a casino, that it knew that if it saw you know, Caesars or Bellagio, it, it couldn't go in there, that was dangerous. But if it saw a small Baptist church, it would raid immediately. In the same way, if it was going through a, any kind of community, if it saw a Walmart or a Costco, it knew that's an inappropriate, not a, a proper place to go. But if it's a small mom and pop shop, they had to invade there right away. Yet these were the rules that were being laid down by our governors and mayors all across the country. Walmart safe, mom and pop not. Casino safe, church not. These rules were rules that simply confounded not only common sense, but constitutional sense. But unfortunately, until this week, our federal courts had turned a blind eye to it. Many of our state courts had turned a blind eye to it. Not all, but most. It took the bravery of a young Trump, 41 Trump appointee, 41 year old federal jurist to point out the obvious. That when he looked at the evidence, he said there was no evidence for the lockdowns. He pointed out that in our entire American history, we had never, ever locked down. We had never suspended all constitutional rights and liberties for any period of time, anywhere, for all the local population, for any reason. He pointed out that, in fact, the evidence that could be produced by the state was weak to non-existent, while the counter evidence was often overwhelming, that there was serious doubts about whether any of these quote-unquote mitigation measures mitigated anything at all. And it was on that basis that he rejected their decision. He noted their logic was internally contradictory, externally contradictory to existing evidence. It didn't even make sense within its own rules. And it was often nothing more than a theoretical white paper being imposed on the population of Pennsylvania to their great expense and detriment. He noted that in fact there was no evidence that public gatherings of the kind that they were trying to be suspended or prohibited or assembly that was being restricted and listed as unlawful.
had caused any form of super spreading event that led to any mass deaths of any kind. Indeed, the only kind that that had been was the nursing home policies the governors of Pennsylvania and Michigan and New York and New Jersey had done, where they forced people who were sick and elderly back into the nursing home to infect the rest. But it wasn't lawful assembly that posed any degree of health threat by any of the documented or detailed evidence. Yet it had been suspended throughout Pennsylvania, not for days, not for weeks, as originally promised, but for months and months and months with no end. As he pointed out, a quarantine is supposed to be sick specific. The person who has, you have clear and convincing evidence that a particular person presents an imminent risk to other people within the community. Fits the same constitutional due process standards we've had for involuntary institutionalization of the mentally ill. The same standards apply to the medically ill. These lockdown orders were not consistent with any form of public quarantine, and the state would admit during the proceedings that in fact it could not meet the definition statutorily or as constitutionally permitted of a quarantine. Instead, they came to a different defense. What was their defense? There's no fundamental right to make a living, period. That was their argument, and they expected a court to accept it, adopt it, and impose it on the rest of us. That no American, no Pennsylvanian in that case, had any fundamental right to make a living, to support their family, to support themselves, Apparently, the words pursuit of happiness no longer appeared in the new Declaration of Independence as written by the Pennsylvania governor. Indeed, despite the fact that the right to make a living was fundamental and established as such from the very inception of our Constitution and repeated as such going back to decisions from the 1800s, somehow that was completely ignored and wished to be obliterated by the new democratic regime in the state of Pennsylvania. They admitted that their definition of quote-unquote life-sustaining businesses, which were given an exception and an exemption from the gathering provisions and the assembly provisions, had no definition at all. There was no standard for it. There was no policy behind it. It changed day to day, week to week. It was like something the Stasi or the Politburo would have come up with. Indeed, as the court noted, it failed to meet even the most basic constitutional standards of governmental action. And it was for that reason that the court determined and rejected what the governor of Pennsylvania said, said there is indeed a right to make a living, there is indeed a right to assemble, and that these rights cannot be suspended in the name of an emergency. They cannot be declared invalid unilaterally by the actions of the executive branch of any government. And he concluded in this way, and it's a conclusion we should all remember as we move forward in the cases that I and other lawyers will be bringing across the country in the name of this case. And this is, here is his final quote. The liberties protected by the Constitution are not fair weather freedoms. The Constitution cannot accept a, quote, new normal, where the basic liberties of the people can be subordinated to open-ended emergency mitigation measures. The Constitution sets lines, and these actions cross those lines. Let it be so across the country. Thank you. With apologies to our other two speakers, I'm not sure how you follow that. Uh, 